You've got a quite the track record when it comes to climate. You've been a part of this for quite some time. Well, it really wasn't my first choice, you know. I uh, and we we can talk about that, but uh, it's something I think that's important because uh, you know a lot of very uh, ruinous uh, policies are being discussed based on what's you know just nonsense and. How did you get your start? You have a background in nuclear physics. Yeah, I'm a nuclear physicist, basically, but I've done a lot of work with lasers. And uh, the reason I got started uh, is uh, for a, a few years, I was director of energy research at U.S. Department of Energy. And um, we had a big budget, you know, it was three and a half billion dollars in 1990 when there was a lot of that was a lot of money. And I uh, had researchers come in and tell me what they were doing with the uh, taxpayers' money once a week. And uh, we would get someone in from uh, uh, Fermi Lab to tell us about the search for the top quark, or someone in from a little startup company to tell us about the latest genome sequencing machine, you know. To, uh, so we were supporting all sorts of science, uh, including climate. And when I would ask someone from the climate research area to come in, they would first say, well, we, uh, uh, we're too busy. And anyway, we work for Senator Gore. <laughs> and uh, well, I said, okay, uh, that's fine. But you know, next year, don't bother to reapply because I, I can use your money for <laughs> someone who works for me. And uh, so then they would grudgingly come, you know, and send an irate message to the senator to tell them that they were being persecuted. So uh, I discovered that it was not like normal science climate, you know. It was this was 1990, and it was very political even then, you know. Uh, what is it the senator wants us to come up with this time, you know? And uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't have anything against working on climate. It is important after all, you know, we know that. But I wanted it to be normal science, you know, where, <laughs> you know, you do the research and you call it uh, as the instruments tell you. So that's sort of when I uh, b began to be more active and speaking out because I recognized that this was a problem. And it wasn't like, Astrology, you know, I, you know, astrology is a little bit like climate science. That uh, a lot of people believe in it, but they don't force it onto the entire world. You know, you can <laughs> buy a horoscope if you like. Uh, you know, sort right with me. And uh, but you shouldn't be forcing everyone in the whole world to buy a horoscope a day. You know, at some inflated price, <laughs> and that's what's going on now with climate. You know, they're a small number of people who are making out like bandits and everybody else is paying for it and the bills will go up and up and up as time goes on. So that's why I'm pushing back. Yeah, There's some people out there pushing horoscopes in that way. You can get in, you can go down a rabbit hole with astrology and people are just as diehard about that as they are climate change in some regard. Well, Astrology is okay with me. I mean, I, but as I said, you know, it should be your personal choice. And, uh, you know, what does the uh, Declaration of Independence say? That you have a right for the pursuit of happiness. And if reading a horoscope makes you happy, you know, you have a right to that. <laughs> Climate change had been on your metaphorical desk in some sense prior to working with the Department of Energy, right? You had published a paper, I believe, in the 80s, kind of extrapolating yes, where we were going to go know, temperature-wise. The reason wise. I was actually at Department of Energy was I'd been a member of Jason for a number of years, which is a little group of scientists who met, met in the summer and worked on mostly classified problems, but some unclassified uh, of interest to the U.S. government, mostly Department of Defense. And uh, one of the things we had been asked to look at was uh, climate and the role of CO2. And so we looked into it. I 
was part of that group, and so my name is on the book, although I was working on something at the same time, which I thought was much more important, which I'll come back to in a minute. But uh, So I, I uh, was a co-author in, in 1982 of this book on the effects of CO2, and uh, yeah, we got the same wrong answer as everyone else. You know, it was just group think that it, if you double CO2, you'll warm by three or four degrees, but that's what everyone else got, so there was no surprise there. And I can tell you, since I was part of the team, it really was uh, uh, simply groupthink. You know, it wasn't a hard calculation. But the reason I, I didn't take it more seriously was I was working on what now is called the uh, Sodium Guide Star. And this is a, um, uh, this was related to Star Wars. Star Wars began in 1982, and that was when you know, President Reagan asked uh, the scientific and engineering community to come up with something better than, you know, mutual assured destruction. You know, the policy when Reagan came to office was, well, uh, we won't have any defenses. And if the Soviet Union, you know, attacks us with nuclear weapons, we'll simply uh, have joint suicide and we'll, uh, we'll wipe out the Soviet Union and uh, they'll wipe out us. And that that's our policy. And uh, Reagan says, you've got to be kidding. You know, I, I, <laughs> you mean I have to commit suicide? And it, there was this nice young military officers, you know, with the red button for him to commit national suicide. And he says, I don't want to do that. Let, let's figure out some way to defend ourselves so that we don't have to uh, uh, start this mad, you know, mutual assured destruction uh, process. So, uh, you know, it, it's not easy defending against missiles. The Ukrainians are trying to do that now, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you can shoot a lot of them down. And uh, at the time, Reagan said, well, think of any crazy thing that might work. And one of the things they considered was um, high-power lasers. And uh, by that time, you know, you could make lasers on the ground with... Uh, megawatts of power, you know, for example, you could make CO2 lasers easily with megawatts of power, and, and there were other types too. And so the, uh, if you put a megawatt of power onto an incoming missile, that will certainly destroy it. it. It just can't tolerate it, even though it's designed to take a lot of heat with heat shields, but it, it can't handle that much. So the, the problem, though, was that if you had this powerful laser on the ground, you had to get that power through the atmosphere to the missile. And of course, it wouldn't work at all if it was a cloudy day. It's a cloudy day here in Princeton, so this would be a good time to attack if you were worried about uh, missile defense, <laughs> about laser defense from missiles, uh, because the clouds put you out of action. But even with no clouds, if it's a perfectly clear day, you know. Uh, by the time the laser beam gets to the missile, it breaks up into hundreds of little sub beams. You know, it, uh, it so you change this high power rifle bullet into you know birdshot. You know, and none of the little pieces of birdshot is big enough to cause any damage to the attacker. And that's because the atmosphere, even on a clear day, is full of little patches of slightly warmer and cooler air. You. You hardly notice it, but if you're careful, you can see it. And uh, that causes a light beam that starts out flat to uh, get more and more wrinkled as it goes through the air. You see it at night with things like twinkling stars. You know, if you look at stars at night, they're not steady and they twinkle because of the little warm and cool patches in the atmosphere. And so the same thing happens with lasers pointing up. They, and they, the big effect is is that there are so many little subbeams that it it doesn't hurt you know the target. <laughs> so the astronomers had worried about this since the days of Isaac Newton. You know it was hundreds of years old problem, and they knew at that time you could correct it if you could measure uh, the incoming light uh, precisely enough. What you could do then was what you're dealing with is what 
should have been a nice flat wavefront, you know, like a sheet of paper, but it's all wrinkled and crumpled. And so what you do is you, instead of bouncing it off a perfect mirror, a nice smooth mirror, you crumple the mirror in the opposite direction. So it's called adaptive optics and it's called a rubber mirror. So you can build mirror, mirrors like that, that will, uh, but that will be just the opposite of the wrinkle wave front. And when it bounces off the wrinkle mirror, it comes back flat, you know. So it comes in wrinkle, it comes back flat, and then uh, it will focus perfectly. And you can do your astronomical observation or vice versa. If you send it out to try and stop a missile, you can pre-wrinkle it in such a way that the atmosphere takes the wrinkles out. And when it reaches the missile, all the power hits the missile. So that's that's the idea. It's adaptive optics is the uh, buzz name for it. And so the uh, astronomers knew how to do that with very bright stars. And so uh, one of the problems uh, was that there are not many bright stars in the sky, you know, maybe half a dozen at best uh, that are bright enough to provide the light to measure this wavefront wrinkling I mentioned. And so if the Russians had attacked us in the direction of one of those bright stars, we could have shot them down, but no reason for them to, to do that. You know, there's a big sky out there. They come any direction they like. And so I said, well, we had a very highly classified meeting about this in 1982. And there were people there from Washington. There are many of them from the Air Force. And uh, so I... Uh, spoke up and I said, look, I know how to solve this because um, we know how to do it with bright stars and I know how to make a bright star anywhere in the sky, you know, artificial star. And uh, so the trick is that it, around the whole earth, there's a layer of sodium atoms at about a hundred kilometer altitude above our heads. And uh, that's always there. It's because of the micrometeorites that the earth plows through, you know, in its orbit around the sun. And so they burn up and they're all, they all have a certain amount of sodium and the sodium stays there at hundred kilometers for a certain length of time. And there's enough of it that it scatters uh, light very well. You can see it, for example, at twilight over, you know, Finland, you know, in the, the long summer nights, that's where it was discovered. And, um, so I said, all you have to do is uh, pick up, make a laser that makes an artificial star and then look toward the star with your wavefront sensor and, and use that bright yellow light from the sodium to do the correction. And you can make the star wherever you like and, and toward the incoming missile, for example. So uh, to make a long story short, that, uh, that actually turned out to work. The Air Force was... Uh, courageous enough to try it out. It was a very secret project for over 10 years. and uh, But it it did work the first time they tried it. And so I got a lot of uh, credit in the classified world. That's why they called me to Washington, because they <laughs> knew I, uh, I knew how to solve problems. And uh, so I knew a lot about the atmosphere even before I started thinking about climate. You know, it was something that was very important, for example, to laser propagation, which uses much the same wavelengths as the uh, thermal radiation that cools the Earth. So I knew more than most climate scientists did about how the atmosphere worked. And I knew that it was, you know, what they were proposing was, was just nonsense. It, you know, it was uh, designed to make sure they, uh, their research grant was renewed next year, you know, as long as... Uh, alarmism over climate was uh, the in thing in Washington, which it was then and it still is today. <laughs> Through those corrective lenses or the use of an artificial star in that case, are we able to permeate through cloud coverage better? Would we have the capability today to stop an incoming missile? It doesn't go through cloud, so you have to have a nice clear night. But, you know, for astronomers, you pick a site where they're very seldom clouds. For example, the observatories in Hawaii are above the cloud layer most of the time. They're at such a high altitude. And there are observatories in Chile on, on the Altiplano, you know, really high up in the Andes where there are almost never clouds. So if you pick the site carefully, then uh, clouds are not a 
Tara Leopold. And every now and then they come, but it's infrequently enough that it doesn't matter. But in terms of defense, still an insanely powerful factor. I mean, there's been a push for these laser weapons. I think they're being utilized in Israel, a push maybe for Ukraine as well. But if you have that cloud coverage, how much can you really stop? Well, uh, that's one of the fundamental problems with lasers is they are vulnerable to the weather, very vulnerable to the weather. Uh, but, you know, there's almost no weapon system that is perfect. You know, it works sometimes and it doesn't. So that's why you typically have a, a whole menu of them. And if one doesn't work, hopefully the other one is able to. <laughs> yeah, not that comforting. That's been the same, you know, over the ages. You know, <laughs> So you're doing this research. Climate is on your radar, obviously, because you're working against it in some ways. And you come out in terms of climate change, and you're in agreement with the projections that most other scientists are putting out, that you have CO2 impacting the environment, impacting climate. And if you were to say double CO2, you're going to have a significant doubling, or not necessarily doubling, but increase in temperature from that 3 to 4%, say. Well, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and it's not the most important. The most important greenhouse gas is water vapor, and if you include clouds, you know, which also acts a lot like a greenhouse gas, uh, water completely dominates, you know, the greenhouse effect on the earth. But CO2 is not negligible. It's about 30% of the effect of water. So it's there. And uh, what a greenhouse gas is, is, it's a gas that if you have clear skies and no clouds, it lets all the sunlight through to reach the surface of the earth. But it is opaque to the thermal radiation that we emit, you know, from the earth. So shortwave radiation like that from the sun passes through greenhouse gases, but long wave radiation, thermal radiation doesn't. And so that tends to trap, you know, the thermal radiation. It, it's harder for the earth to cool because it's though you had this blanket of greenhouse gases keeping you a little bit warmer than you otherwise would be. And uh, there's not much mystery about that. You know, it's uh, been known for a very long time. The first person to really uh, recognize the importance was an Irish, uh, Anglo-Irish physicist, John uh, Tyndall, back in the 1850s or 1860s. And he did some of the very first experiments to show that water vapor and CO2 uh, were greenhouse gases. And... Uh, he was a very good experimentalist, and then, then uh, 30 or 40 years later, the Swedish uh, theorist, uh, Arrhenius, he was a chemist, theoretical chemist, uh, made the first attempts to calculate how much warming you would get from increasing CO2, and he, uh, it was a pretty good start because the data he had wasn't very good, but he estimated, uh, his last estimated was that if you double CO2, you'll warm the earth by about four degrees centigrade. I think the true answer is if you double it, it's about one degree, you know, but that's not bad considering that it was 1900 and, or actually it was 1896 and it was before the invention of quantum mechanics. So he was a smart guy. And, uh, but uh, that, that's typical of science. You know, your, your first attempt is, is pretty good, but you refine it as time goes on and you learn more and you get more skilled. But nothing has changed. You know, they're still using Arrhenius's figure, you know, you know, now 100 years later, which is very unusual for science. Usually things get better, you know. And in this case, there's been no change because they don't want it to get smaller. Four degrees is about the minimum you can have to keep people alarmed and keep your research funding coming. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting with that refinement of data that normally takes place, you don't see that in the climate research, right? It, it seems like their data is still, even today, significantly off of the real world data. That's, that's certainly true. You, if you look, you know, they... Climate is complicated. You know, if you try to do it in detail, uh, you do need computers. And so they've gotten bigger and bigger computers, but they're still far from big enough. And so they have all sorts of approximations on how you handle fluid flow and radiation transport and clouds. And uh, 
they talk about tuning their models. They put together the best model they can. And then, it, of course, it gives the wrong answer. And then everybody agrees the answer should be if you double, you get three degrees. And so they tune this parameter and they tune that parameter. And eventually it gives the right answers, the so-called right answer. <laughs> and so they, it really is not uh, predictive, you know, in spite of what they claim. It, it's, it's simply fitting to uh, what the narrative wants the answer to be. And um, I mean, it's true, we're, we're seeing some warming since uh, roughly 1800. You know, we went through this uh, very cold period called the Little Ice Age that b began in the 1300s, 1400s. It's what froze the poor Norse farmers out of Greenland. Yeah, Greenland really was a pretty nice place in the year 1000 and the year 1100. You know, there were green farms and fields of, you know, barley and sheep. And uh, then it got cold and... Uh, the farmers left or died out. I, no one's quite sure what happened to them. And it stayed cold until the 1700s. And then it began to warm up again for reasons that nobody knows. It was long before CO2 started increasing. But that's uh, particularly clear if you look at things like glaciers where uh, you can, uh, we have good records of recent glacial activity and the glaciers in Alaska and in the Alps began to melt around 1800, and they receded very, very rapidly. And in fact, in Alaska, most of the glaciers in Glacier Bay were gone by 1870, which was long, long before there was any increase in CO2, any, any appreciable increase. In fact, uh, John Muir, the great environmentalist, made a special trip to Alaska to try and understand what was going on, and he published a wonderful book, which is still worth reading, called Travels in Alaska. And He went to Glacier Bay, and he pointed out that most of the ice was gone in the last 50 years, and that uh, if you talk to the Indians, they told you, well, yes, uh, the ice never was here to begin with. It came 200 years ago and covered our hunting grounds, and now it's finally going back again. So it was ice that was formed uh, during the Little Ice Age. And if you look at the geological record, this has happened many times over the past 10,000 years. So although we're in a rel relatively stable interglacial period now, the Holocene, there are still big climate fluctuations within that. And the current fluctuation we're seeing is almost identical to a half a dozen that are recorded over the past 10,000 years. There's no evidence that much of it is due to CO2. And it's hard to make the case on basic physics that much of it could be. CO2 will cause some warming, but not very much. You know, so I, I would guess some of the current warming is from CO2, but most of it has been natural recover from recovery from the Little Ice Age. And yet, if you were to turn on the news, they would say, oh, the ice caps are melting. And if you track the progression of that, it started around the Industrial Revolution. It's CO2. We're pumping out too much CO2 and we're melting the ice, which is going to therefore raise sea levels. Not looking back and recognizing, oh, has this ice been melting before that? How much ice was there previously? Yeah. Well, it's certainly true that... Uh Glaciers on land, Alaska, the Alps, other parts of the world have receded, uh, but the most rapid uh, uh, recession was before CO2 started increasing, so there's not a cause and effect relationship there. You know, if it were CO2, it, now is when we should see the rapid retreat of glaciers, but if you go to Glacier Bay, the retreat has almost stopped and some of them are growing again. <laughs> So it doesn't fit the narrative uh, at all. And that, that's true around the world. You know, it, uh, uh, you know, nature is just not cooperating with, uh, with the storyline. <laughs> Unfortunately, right? Well, fortunately for us, yeah. I mean, I think nature is doing what it has always done, and nobody quite knows it. it it's too bad because these, these are important, you know, these coolings, for example, and the Little Ice Age, they caused enormous devastation to humanity. There were famines and plagues in Europe, you know, the 
I mentioned the nor poor Norse settlers got frozen out of Greenland. And so it would be great if we knew how to predict these things and knew how to cope with them and know when the next one is coming. Uh, and uh, the attempt to do that has probably been set back by 50 years by this uh, fixation on CO2, which doesn't appear to have very much effect on climate at all. And, and certainly had had nothing to do with these previous warmings and coolings because people weren't driving SUVs, you know, 6,000 BC or, or 4,000 BC. Yeah. But there were big climate fluctuations then, yeah, bigger than the ones we're seeing today. And that's an interesting point that the climate historically has never been stable. That's right, yeah. And it's not a fear of global warming necessarily that should be on the front of mind for everyone. If you talk to people who are actually in deep with the research, global cooling is the actual threat. Yeah, if you look at human history, uh, we've lived through many warmings and coolings, and almost every warming has been good for civilization. The, you know, culture thrives, uh, people multiply, and every cooling has been bad. You know, there's famine, there's uh, plague, you know. Uh, so, the experimental evidence is that warming is good and cooling is bad. And in fact, you know, the many of the same people who became climate warming and alarmists began their careers in the 1960s and 70s as global cooling alarmists. And, and then they just seamlessly switched to a warming alarmists. <laughs> you know, uh, Steve Schneider, the late Steve Schneider, who I, I kind of admire, but because he was uh, very honest about many of these things, uh, but he switched. He was a big uh, global cooling uh, scaremonger in 1970, and at the time he died, he was a big global warming scaremonger. So he was a scaremonger all his life, except that it flipped signed. <laughs> yeah, that was new to me, the realization that in the 1970s, it was a fear of the new ice age. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And it was getting colder, you know, nobody quite knows why. And uh, I remember I was in New York City at the time, and uh, I had an apartment up on uh, 125th Street where I could look out over the Hudson River. And uh, during those winters in the 70s, you would see these enormous ice flows coming down the Hudson. And, uh, you know, I, I moved to New York in 19... 65, and there were no ice flows in 1965, but 72, 73, you could practically walk across the ice in New Jersey on some winters. And so they were right. You know, it really was getting colder, and it was obviously getting colder. But, you know, nobody to this day, I think, knows exactly what happened. My, my own guess, it almost certainly had something to do with the sun. But uh, we've wasted so much time, we, we uh, don't know for sure, you know, what might have happened. Is anybody looking back at that data trying to figure out an answer to it? Or we're focused on the present now? No, I think most people are uh, just fixated on, on, you know, supporting the narrative that, you know, evil mankind is, is about to destroy the planet <laughs> with uh, too much CO2. Uh, I, there are certainly a few honest people trying to look back at that, but they have a hard time getting funding. They have a hard time getting data. And the data wasn't very good back then. You know, the first satellite data started coming in about 1980. And uh, we had some measurements earlier there, back in the 70s, but it was sporadic. You do a measurement one year and then there'd be five or six years, you wouldn't get anything. But since about 1980, we've got pretty steady information coming in from satellites and uh the real heroes there at least for temperature are the uh, uh roy spencer and john christie at university of alabama huntsville they're the ones who pioneered the use of uh, microwave uh, instruments on satellites to measure atmospheric temperature and so that's been very very helpful but it only started a 1980 or maybe a year or two earlier than that um, and we've only been measuring CO2 precisely since, I don't know, the mid-60s or something, late 60s. Uh, that was due to the work of Ralph Keeling, you know, who put 
put together the first CO2 observatories uh, that have been producing high quality data. So we're lucky to have that data, but, but we don't have anything before then. And so you have to kind of guess what were the CO2 levels, the best estimates we have come from the ice cores from Antarctica or, or Greenland. But, uh, you know, that's indirect and uh, everything like that has systematic errors. You're not quite sure whether you accounted for them fully or not. And, uh, but, uh, but the modern data is very good. In terms of land data, however, we have a little bit more leeway, correct? Wasn't England, didn't they have some temperature measurements going back to the 1700s? They do. There's this famous central England temperature record that goes back to the 1700s, as you say. And uh, it doesn't show anything very alarming. You know, it shows relatively constant temperature. You can see a little uptick at the end of the little ice age, but it's not very big. And... um, so it's certainly it's certainly not calls for alarm. Well, it seems like a major point of contention with land measurements like that is the urban heat island effect. That's right. That's right. You know, if you look at temperatures that come from thermometers on the ground, before the satellites uh, started producing data or people taking it seriously, the these ground-based measurements were showing just uh, frightening increases of temperature, but it turned out that most of that was due to encroachment of suburbs around temperature measuring stations. So a thermometer station, which had been measuring in a green, cool field 50 years ago, is now surrounded by blacktop and houses. And uh, guess what? You were getting rapidly increasing temperatures, but it wasn't due to some fundamental increase of temperature. It was because you're surrounded by blacktop <laughs> and houses. And uh, so it's, it's difficult to get that out of the land-based data because everywhere in the world, you know, development is going on, suburbans are sprawling, you know, airports are expanding. And so um, I think there are honest scientists who who do their best to clean that out, but it, it, uh, you know, sometimes rather than cleaning out a a really poorly designed experiment, it's better to design a new experiment that's free of it. And that's sort of what the satellites were. Yeah. And it makes sense. If you have this, this data that is so easily corruptible in terms of, In the past, you might have these thermometers out in the field, and now they're in the heart of a city like London, where you have a condensed human population. You have a ton of concrete, these buildings. Obviously, the temperature is going to rise. Right. Well, uh, one, one thing that people have tried to do is they pick particular stations that have remained rural and only use those. But the problem is that there are not many of them, and so that means you're only sampling a few locations in, in every state, every part of Great Britain or the rest of the world, and so you're not sure what to do about all the rest of the Earth, you know, including the 70% that's ocean, where, where you have practically no data, you know. So it's very difficult to use ground-based uh, measurements to get something that uh, you can be confident uh, in. And, but the satellites, I think uh, people do take seriously. It. I certainly do. And, uh, and there's competition, you know. It's not just, uh, it's not just Christie and Spencer. There is a private company in California that does the same measurements. And, uh, and I think there are a few in other countries too. And so they're all looking at the data and they're competing with each other and they're getting the same answer. So uh, that's reassuring. Plus they get, the, people- they get the same answer as, as weather balloons. Uh, people don't realize how much data we get every day from weather balloons. Uh, there are thousands that are launched every day and they float up to the stratosphere and they send down radio signals telling the ground what temperatures they experience, what relative humidity they experienced 
often what the wind directions were. And, and those are direct measurements, right, in situ, and they agree with what the satellites uh, are, are producing. The satellite is much, uh, much more global, you know. People don't launch weather balloons uh, over the Pacific or <laughs> the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but satellites don't mind measuring there. <laughs> and even from the limited data on ocean temperature, if you compare that to rural temperature, they're comparable. And not just comparable, but lower than the projections from land-based temperatures. That's right. All, all of the temperature changes are much less than forecast by computer models. That's right. There's a, there's something wrong with the computer models, and uh, they're just too stubborn to uh, admit that uh, they're uh, they overestimated the effects of CO two. There have been one or two. I, I think there's a Russian model that actually is pretty good but they've not been under the same pressure as uh, modelers in the West uh, to conform to the uh, alarmist narrative. <laughs> yeah. Is it harder to stick by that narrative, though, now where you are receiving this data from satellites that's harder to ignore even compared to the computer model data? Well, uh, you would think that people would take the data from satellites and extrapolate that, and that doesn't give you a very alarming warming rate. But instead of doing that, they, they take the model projections, which give much faster temperature rises, and, and they also take model economic projections of, you know, growth of fossil fuel use and growth of the human population, which are also clearly wrong. They're producing much faster growth than is, is possible to happen. But that's what they use. So they use anything that makes uh, the situation look as alarming as possible. And uh, so that's what you plan to. <laughs> and uh, It's hard to believe that you would choose to stick with a model that continuously is projecting wrong information. And not just wrong, but statistically higher than the levels we're seeing. You would think somebody would say, hey, this is clearly not accurate. It doesn't have a great track record. Maybe we need to start looking into these other avenues. Yeah, you're right. It's very puzzling. Uh, but, you know, that's the way cults are. You know, they, they're all these doomsday cults where someone projects the world is going to end, you know, uh, on uh, tomorrow. And yeah, tomorrow comes, the world doesn't end. And you would think that the doomsday followers would then give up and say, yes, we were wrong, but no, they are just convinced, no, we, we were right, it's just we got the day wrong, it's still going to, the world is still going to end, but it's going to be three months later, and then three months come, nothing happens, and, but they never change their minds, you know, they, it's a peculiarity of the human uh, psyche, I, I, people study it, I, you know, it's beyond me, I don't understand it. When did that change start to take place for you? It seems like at least in the 80s, early 90s, you were more in alignment with the standard, the status quo amongst the researchers, that CO2 is contributing, global warming is higher. Well, you know, I, I get, as I said uh, earlier, it never bothered me if, if people uh, sort of hyperventilated about CO2 as long as it had no economic consequences or political consequences for the rest of the world. It, you know, like astrology, it, it didn't bother me. You know, I, I sort of laughed at it. I thought they uh, were overestimating their skill at predictions, but it didn't bother me. But now, you know, we're, uh, uh, we're talking about having Irish farmers slaughter, you know, a third of their cattle, you know, banning agriculture in the Netherlands, you know, getting rid of, rid of beef cattle in the United States, uh, you know, getting rid of the internal combustion engine, you know. So th this is beginning to get serious. You know, this is beginning to look like a, uh, more like a suicide uh, pact, you know, suicide cult than, uh, anything else, because if you follow these things to their logical conclusion, they, they're clearly not going to work, and uh, many, many people will suffer, and so at this point, uh, 
I felt I had to do something. I, I often mentioned to people that this nice uh, correspondence between Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his uh, sister. Dietrich was one of the few brave German pastors who opposed the Nazis and uh, stayed in Germany to try and, and stop them. You know, many of the others opposed, but they ran away to America and Europe, you know, so to be safe, you know, or to England, you know. But Bonhoeffer stayed there, and of course he was arrested, and eventually the Nazis hung him. But his sister wrote and said, why don't you be like the everybody else? You can just keep your mouth shut, and uh, then you'll be okay. They won't touch you. You're a pastor, you know, a man of God. And he said, well, it's like this, you know, if I'm in a car, and the, you know, the passenger seat, and the driver is... Uh, accelerating toward a stone wall and all the passengers are going to be killed when the wreck occurs. It's my duty to try to wrest the steering wheel from him, you know, and stop the car, <laughs> right? So it's, it's that idea, you know, that when leadership is leading in the wrong direction and, and in a serious way where uh, there's going to be really bad things happening, if you continue, then you should try and stop it, you know, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. When did you first notice that shift from, oh, they're just maybe over projecting slightly with the data to now this has taken a more, what would you say, impactful turn where they're trying to use it as an economic bludgeon? It probably began earlier than uh, I noticed it, but certainly by the the 19 by 1995 it was clear that things were not going well you know that you had al gore as the vice president of the united states and uh you had uh, increasing uh shrillness by the climate fanatics and uh the media was being taken over by uh i i get prop you know specialists for climate you know they were funded by billionaires and uh so you couldn't get balanced news anymore. And so uh, certainly by the mid nineties, I was beginning to get very worried and it's only gotten worse since then. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, sooner or later it will, it will come to an end because as I mentioned, it, it really is a suicide pact and people don't want to commit suicide. You know, they don't realize that that's what they're being asked to do. Something a little bit like that happened in Sol Sri Lanka, you know, in Ceylon uh, four or five years ago, where the government came in and said, uh, you know, we're going to take Sri Lanka back to the bliss of the pre-industrial age and everyone is going to be healthy and happy and we're going to do only organic farming and we're going to ban fossil fuels and fertilizers. And so, you know, it wasn't hard to predict what happened within 12 months. You know, the price of rice went up by 10. People were starving. They couldn't get anything to eat because all the crops failed. The tea crop failed, so there's no foreign exchange. There were riots and the, you know, demonstration. They stormed the presidential palace, and the, the president was just lucky to have been evacuated by helicopter, or, the, or they would have hung him. And uh, so, you know, we when something, when policies get so bad that, that people really begin to suffer, you know, they get changed, you know, pe people really, most people are not willing to, <laughs> to drink the Kool-Aid, you know, it, uh, there are similarities, you know, to other cults, you know, that have been very, uh, very worrisome. And uh, so I, I don't think most people of the world are going to drink this Kool-Aid, not forever. That's only if they realize they're in a cult, right? You do have these cults where people unknowingly are a part of it and do end up drinking the Kool-Aid. They don't have that moment of recognition before it's too late. That's right, right, yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, that's an interesting case because there were so many people down in Guyana with the Reverend Jim Jones and... Uh, but when the time came, many of them actually did not want to drink it, and they were forced to drink it, you know, 
Jim Jones had people with guns, you know, and uh, so you either drank the Kool-Aid and died of cyanide poisoning or you got shot to death. And so if you counted, they were all killed. You counted the victims, a good number were shot because they wouldn't drink this Kool-Aid. So uh, that, that's also something that you should keep in mind when you start noticing that uh, centers of power are being taken over by uh, fanatics, climate fanatics. That's when you should really start getting scared, you know, and uh, I don't see that happening. I don't think that will happen, but it, it's something that has happened in the past. And, uh, you know, so we shouldn't forget. And in some ways, feels like it has happened to a serious degree. You have these institutions, you have researchers, you have people in the government all the way up to the president who seem to be wholesale on this path without any question especially in terms of CO2 usage. Yeah, lots of people have bought into it. It's, um, you know, I don't think most of them uh, think of it as a suicide pact, you know. And there are many reasons. Um, there are many very sincere people who've simply been brainwashed, you know. They don't have a very strong technical background. And all they've heard since they were little children was, you know, the uh, uh, evil pollutant carbon dioxide is about to destroy the world and uh, you should make sure your parents uh, trade in their automobile for a bicycle or <laughs> something like that. And so they're sincere people and they, they've just been misled. And there are a lot of them like that. And then there are other people who are opportunists, you know, the, the, lots of people are making a lot of money, you know, from sustainability you know, and so if you put up a, uh, a wind turbine, you're guaranteed subsidies. If you buy an electric car, you're guaranteed subsidies, you know, from the government, from both the feds and from the state. And so there are uh, people who profit from this. Uh, and uh, so I, I sometimes it's joke, that, and it's not entirely a joke, that it's a combination of uh, a religious cult and organized crime because, uh, you know, the uh, drifting with sustainability is just disgusting and it's just obvious, obviously corrupt, but it goes on and on, you know, and, and everybody gets his share. And so if you hand it out to enough people, you, know, you can keep them happy until the whole thing collapses. It will eventually collapse. I've listened to a number of your talks in preparation for this and that idea of this being some form of cold yeah. is brutally apparent. Yeah. Where do scientists fall on this graph? Are they ideologically captured? Do they believe that this is an existential threat and are implementing some form of bias to use the data to reinforce that? Is it a financial capture? Well, again, it's complicated. The people who um, actually are doing research in climate have a severe conflict of interest because unless their research supports uh, alarmism, they don't get their grant renewed. So I feel a little sorry for those people because they're working on important uh, science, but uh, they've got this constraint that they have to shade it toward the alarmist message. And then there are all the other scientists who really don't work directly on climate. They're biologists, high-energy physicists, you know, uh, geologists uh, who are not directly uh, working uh, on things related to climate. And they, uh, they tend to support the alarmism, you know. They don't actually know very much about it, you know. They, uh, you know, of course, you have to do some hard work to understand the climate. It's kind of complicated. And uh, most people don't have time to put in that, uh, especially if you're working hard on your own research area. The last thing you're going to do is pause to learn about climate, put aside two or three years to learn about it. So they think, well, their fellow academics, their fellow scientists, uh, surely they would not uh, uh, deceive me. It must be what they say is correct. And uh, so they rally around, you know, sort of... Uh, the herd instinct, you know, <laughs> my, my country, right or wrong. And uh, then, uh, 
you know, if, if they break, break ranks, uh, they have to be pretty hard. Uh, they have to have a lot of character to be able to do that because they're ostracized, you know, this, you know, so-and-so is a climate denier. Can you believe that? You know, and, uh, don't talk to him. Don't talk to his wife. Don't talk to his children. You know, so it's uh, it's a peculiar academic uh, pressure that is less uh, in other parts of society. But academia really is a ghetto, and it, it really is subject to peer pressure much more than many are other parts of society. And so that works for the climate alarmists uh, right now. The uh, politically correct uh, position, which everybody has to hew to, is uh, that there's a disaster coming and we have to all do whatever's necessary to stop it. <laughs> They're really not willing to do what is necessary, uh, and there's really nothing to stop <laughs> because there is no emergency. It's, yeah, I mean, that's the most ironic thing of all, is that if you really look at the effects of CO2 dispassionately, it's only made the world a better place. The the only clear effect you can see is that the world is greener today than it was 50 years ago when satellite measurements began. And uh, it's, it's completely clear that that's due to more CO2. Desert edges are shrinking. And that's because with more CO2, plants don't need as much water. So areas that were too arid in 1950 to support plant growth haven't gotten any more rain, but their plants are able to grow there because they don't need as much rain as they did in 1950 because there's more CO2. And um, so that that's quite clear. And uh, that was clear long, long ago because for 100 years, uh, greenhouse operators have uh, intentionally doubled or tripled the CO2 levels inside the greenhouse just because the plants grow so much better. You know, you get better flowers, better tomatoes, you get a better price when you take them to market. And so everybody has known for a long time that plants have been starved for CO2 for uh, quite a few million years now. And so there's nothing bad about CO2 coming back, and it's still far, far below the average levels that have prevailed over geological history, or at least recent geological history. Yeah, at four, we're, what's the estimation now that we're at 423 parts per million in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere? Around May, yeah, maybe 430. It, it's, you know, it's not quite the same in the north as it is in the southern hemisphere, but that's a pretty good number for, say, Hawaii. Yeah. But taking that, we're in a CO2 drought in some sense. We are in a CO2 drought, that's right. CO2 famine, I often say. Because, you know, plants really eat three things, you know, to nourish the whole world. And one of the things they eat are CO2, the other is water, yeah, and the third is sunlight. You know, you have to have all three. And uh, there's not much we can do about sunlight. Uh, water we can you know, irrigate. And uh, CO2, for a long time, people thought of as uh, just constant, and there's not much you can do about it, except for the greenhouse operators that I mentioned. But more CO2 is just like uh, irrigation. Uh, everything is growing better with more CO2. And uh, we should be happy about that. Most people are not happy about it. <laughs> they, for example, they claim, you know, the, that uh, produce grown in more CO2 is... Uh, not nutritious. And uh, that's complete nonsense. You know, we've just written a paper on that where we look carefully at it and it's, 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 it's complete uh, nonsense. More plants are growing better and they're providing more nutrition, not just more calories. And uh, uh, so there's nothing bad about more CO2. It's a fundamentally a blessing to mankind. And yet proponents of the climate change end times message would say that this is all settled science that scientists agree co2 is a major cause of climate change and we need to reach net zero yeah that's right well you know science i'm sure you know science is never settled uh, that uh, <laughs> the characteristic of science is if it's really science it has to be something that can be uh, challenged and disproved, it has to be falsifiable, right? And 
the idea that something like the, the climate narrative is not falsifiable it already tells you it's not science. It tells you it's a religious, you know, dogma. And uh, I mean, even in my own field of physics, which is very precise field and uh, has had some smart people, uh, lots of things that Newton, you know, a, a genius came up with have been falsified in the years since. And uh, things that Einstein came up with have been falsified in the years since. And uh, uh, not in a big way, but, but that's the whole point is uh, I've got a theory. Okay, where does it not work? You know, so that's sort of like the first law of engineering. Turn her on and see why she don't work, right? <laughs> And that's true of physical theories. You know, what, what a, an honest scientist should be doing all the time is trying to poke holes in the existing, uh, you know, view of his field of science. And if you're not doing that, then uh, you shouldn't call yourself a scientist. I don't know what you should call yourself. I don't know, a curator maybe, I don't know, a mu museum uh, docent. <laughs> Yeah, it feels like a rebuke against science in some way. The idea that you are not allowed to pose a question against the current narrative. You have to just adhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's a famous philosopher of science, uh, Karl Popper, who uh, wrote a, a very nice article on that, on the importance of falsification. You can find it on the internet. But at the time he wrote, which was in the... 1920s, uh, the most exciting science was uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, Marxism, and Einstein's relativity. And so Popper pointed out that there was this striking difference between Einstein's relativity and Freudian psychology or Marxist uh, economics, and, uh, and that was that you could actually prove that Einstein's uh, relativity was wrong if you did an experiment and it got the answer that was not predicted by the theory. <laughs> so Einstein, for example, predicted that there would be a bending of starlight. And, you know, it was very exciting in 1919. There was a solar eclipse where you could bend, you could measure the bending of starlight, and uh, people were chewing their fingernails. Uh, is this going to disprove Einstein, or is it going to? you know, confirm his predictions. And it turned out that it confirmed the predictions. It did bend, and more or less uh, as predicted within the eras. There, there were not terribly precise experiments. We've got much better ones today. But there was nothing you could um, predict for Marxism or for Freudian psychology that could be disproved. Anything you predicted, they, they could explain it. So it was not possible to falsify them. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> that's characteristic. Good science can be falsified. And if it's not falsifiable, it's not science. Yeah. Are there any scientists that have a solid foundation in climate, either through physics or another avenue, that are in an opposition to you, in opposition to your stance that CO2 is not this beneficial and something that we don't need to be worried about and should almost be a proponent of? Well, yeah, there are a lot of uh, good scientists who work on uh, sort of establishment climate science and uh, they, um, they're they well-trained, you know, and they've written some good papers. and uh, But it's very, very difficult for them to speak out against the... Uh, the narrative because they'll lose their funding, you know, they uh, will get this uh, brand of climate denier, you know, and uh, so not many people are willing to take that risk. Uh, those who do are, are typically uh, just about to retire. So there have been a few uh, very eminent scientists who've changed their tune after retirement. And uh, but uh, while you're still working, and especially if you're young, it's extremely difficult to uh, to buck the system. One uh, exception to that, who I have a lot of respect for, is uh, this geophysicist, physicist, uh, 
the Veliki, Veliki, uh, who recently uh, retired from, I've forgotten where, maybe it's Georgia Tech, some university in the Southeast, because he just couldn't take the uh, dishonesty anymore. And, uh, but, you know, he's from a family where the, the, they had a construction business, so he had a job to go to, and he would probably make more money as, than being a professor anyway. So uh, if you don't have that opportunity, it's really a big risk to take. And so most young people in particular are, uh, are just can't do it. You know, they've got families to raise up, kids to send to college, uh, bills to pay. <laughs> So that happened in, you know, in Soviet Union, they had this crazy uh, Lysenko who uh, was, uh, you know, dead set against uh, genetics, against hybrid corn, all, all sorts of crazy ideas because they didn't agree with Marxism, Leninism. And it set back biology for decades, many decades in the Soviet Union. Uh, but very few biologists were willing to contradict him, and the few who did were immediately fired. If they were lucky, they were only fired. A number were sent to concentration camps, and, and some were sent, sentenced to death. And uh, so uh, when science gets politicized that way, uh, it uh, becomes very dangerous, and uh, that sort of happened with climate. Absolutely happened. Right. That's one of the terrifying things is the reinforced cohesion on this topic. And it's obviously terrifying for established scientists to be afraid to go against the grain. But what chance does a freshly minted postdoc have if they're coming out of university looking for a job? I mean, how can we anticipate them to look at the data and not form the same conclusions because, well, I have to work. I have to, I just, I incurred all this debt. I need a job. I'm not going to go against the grain here. I don't have a chance. Right, right. No, you're right. It's And it's set back the climate field just as Lysenkoism set back biology in Russia. I think climate has been set back very, very seriously by this fixation on CO2 you know, it, it is important. There are lots of fascinating uh, physics problems to solve, chemistry problems to solve, geology problems, and, and that's been all brushed aside to fixate on CO2 and, and uh, net zero. And uh, so you can't afford to cast any doubt whatever on that or, or you're, you know, you lose your job, you lose your funding. Yeah. Is, have you seen anything encouraging that that is changing, at least in terms of established scientists, or are most still waiting until they retire or they can get a private job where they're not influenced in the same way or exposed to the same dogma? No, I, I don't see any sign of change. I, I think it's going to gonna take a little bit longer and something bad is going to have to happen. I mean... You know, often these things are brought to an end by uh, some catastrophe that uh, uh, resulted in part because of the dogma. And uh, one example of that is, uh, say, the theory of eugenics was uh, very, very popular. It was almost a cult in our country, in the United States, and in Great Britain in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, the idea was that you know, there was this uh, clearly superior Anglo-Saxon race that was being uh, uh, genetically contaminated by all these low IQ Italians and Jews and Chinamen coming into America or coming into Britain. And uh, you, they even had scientific journals that, you know, they tested the IQs of these people. Of course, they were all low IQ compared to the good old Anglo-Saxons. And, um, uh, it was all nonsense. It was lies, you know, and, but yet there were scientific journals and there were uh, newspaper reporters writing glowing uh, articles about saving the, uh, the gene pool. And, uh, you know, the presidents of Princeton and Harvard and Stanford were all big eugenicists and Woodrow Wilson and uh, Alexander Graham Bell. And it was all lies. It, it was just nonsense. And, uh, 
uh, yeah, you couldn't stop it. You know, people would point out there were honest people at that time, and they pointed out, well, these studies don't make any sense. You know, you gave this IQ test to a guy who can't read English. What is what score is he supposed to get on the test? You know, right? It, it, it's just stupid. And uh, what finally brought it down was uh, it was taken over with uh, just ferocious enthusiasm by the Nazis, you know, and and so it was one of the pillars of. Uh, you know, their final solution, you know, and so uh, it's a horrible way to bring it to an end, but that brought it to an abrupt halt in, uh, in the rest of the, the world when everybody saw what the Nazis did with it, when they finally woke up and realized this has all been a lie from the beginning, and yet the Nazis have taken this lie, you know, and they've made it part of their policy. <laughs> You know, there never was such a thing as an Aryan race. You know, the average German Jew was a German. He wasn't a Jew, right? You know, he had the, the faith. God bless him for that. But uh, the whole thing was uh, just awful. And uh, mankind seems to be capable of, capable of doing that again and again and again. They, we don't seem to learn. Yeah. And has shown that we will walk blindly off the edge of a cliff. That's my big fear is that you're right in that sense. Something cataclysmic is going to have to happen before we can course correct. I, I, that's that may be. I, I hope. I hope I'm wrong. You know. So fingers crossed. You know. I hope you're wrong too, but it doesn't feel like the trajectory we're on would reinforce that. Well, what you can hope is that if it does happen, it will happen in one country. And that will give all the other countries a chance to reform uh, so as not to repeat, you know, the uh, the awful <laughs> object lesson that you've just witnessed. So, for example, Germany may uh, collapse. You know, it, it's they're having a hard time now with all of their, you know, energy venda, you know, wind and solar. They're losing industry. Uh, prices of electricity are uh, going through the roof, you know, people can't pay their bills. And uh, so, for example, if Germany would, were to go under economically, that might be a sufficient, or California, you know, there, or South Australia, there, there are various parts of the world where zealots have more influence than other parts. And uh, so if one of these were big enough and uh, if it collapsed in, in uh, a dramatic enough way, it might finally wake the rest of the world up. Yeah, I'm in California and it is terrifying in some regards to watch all of this play out. I mean, the push to ban all gas-powered vehicles, which I think is going to take place in by 2030, they're removing gas-powered lawn equipment. I mean, you can feel the the churn to an astounding rate in California. And especially, like you said, in Europe, they are full sail on this path at any expense. We need to start eliminating cattle. We, we have to reach these net zero targets, regardless of the consequences, regardless of how many people starve, food prices, energy prices. I, I mean, it's, it's insane. When you look at it, if you can separate yourself from all of it and just take a pragmatic overlook. It's terrifying. No, you're right. It, it really is. It is so it is insanity. And uh but you know, even in insane times there are people who make a good living from it. And so you sh somehow that message needs to get out too that uh this is a massive transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich, you know. So in I remember I was in California a few years ago at a DOE lab, and I noticed that uh, they had electrical chargers. This was Palo Alto. It was at Slack. And uh, so you could drive up your Tesla and plug in the charger and charge the battery. And uh, so I had a little time. I looked at the charger, and it was 10 cents a kilowatt hour to charge your battery. So when I got home, I looked up what the uh, Mexican gardener was paying for electricity in Palo Alto, you know, as opposed to the uh, DOE employee, and he's paying 40 cents a kilowatt hour. <laughs> so, you know, the Mexican gardener, you know, he's made a minimal wage, a minimum wage is 
subsidizing these high paid professors and researchers, you know, to charge their Teslas. You know, so it's, it's profound. I mean, it's, it's the reverse of Robin Hood, rob from the poor to give to the rich. <laughs> you know, why the rich are willing to put up with that, I don't know. I mean, they, sim- they apparently have no consciousness, uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, and that's in a first world country. If you look at the dichotomy between first world and third world, it's even more apparent. I mean, you have these third world countries that can't get loans to build coal plants, to build the infrastructure that they need so people aren't starving to death because they don't meet net zero targets. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, There's a lot of pressure on African countries, for example, to go green. And uh, the last thing they need to do is go green. I mean, it it just is so nauseating to see these, uh, uh, you know, trust fund, you know, Ivy League students uh, explaining how they're going to uh, help the poor Africans. You know, poor African has been hoing corn, you know, making a living the hard way, you know, all his life. And here's this kid who's uh, lived a life of luxury, you know, with uh, going to Princeton, you know, going to go out and tell some African woman how to bake bread with a solar oven. They've never baked a loaf of bread themselves. <laughs> it's absurd, you know. I mean, the hypocrisy, and it just, it's just hard to take. <laughs> yeah. The ideolo- ideolo- ideological capture amongst the youth is a point of concern. I mean, I'm 26, and in my generation, there is almost no dissent against the climate narrative. I mean, we, we have, I don't know what you would say, indoctrinated an entire generation? Yeah, I mean, your, your generation has been brainwashed. I mentioned that earlier, and uh, uh, I think that's one of the most shameful things of this whole movement. And, uh, you know, if you look at the population, there are always some really uh, – sensible people who uh, will not be misled and your generation will have some of those you're one of them but they're not many and then there are others who just want to be uh accepted and do the right thing and so if that's what the system is teaching me <laughs> that you know we have to save the planet well of course we'll save the planet you know whatever we have to do we'll do and then there are others who get a kind of anaphylactic shock from this treatment and uh, they just said, well, I'm not going to have any children, you know, the world is coming to an end or in the worst case, I'm going to commit suicide to make the planet better, you know, and there are, even, uh, there are cases like that, you know, and so it's just awful what we've done to the youth and uh, uh, it sort of happened in the Soviet Union and, uh, you know, if you were a kid born in the... Uh, <laughs> Soviet Union, the first thing you uh, became was a, a little October, October, October you know, an, an, an October kid. And uh, that was before you went to nursery school. And then you became a, uh, a red kerchief uh, kid. And, and then you became a, a, a Komsomol, you know. So they had these levels and, and everybody studied Marxism, Leninism, and then uh, so there was a Soviet man, you know, and uh, it it ran for 80 years, you know, so there were lots of people like this. I remember visiting once uh, uh, Kharkov, not Kharkov, uh, Kazan, Kazan, which is a uh, city on the upper Volga, where the Volga turned south. And uh, when we got to our hotel, the driver says, look over there, you see that... Uh, log cabin that's Lenin's house that's where the Lenin family lived when he was a student in Kazan and so the next day my wife and sister and I were on this tour we went we walked over to the uh, Lenin house and we were the only visitors there this was after the breakup of the Soviet Union so we went in and the uh, there was a lady at the desk and uh, 
she says, why are you here? I said, well, it says museum out there. We, the Lenin Museum was very, we're visitors from America. We'd like to see the Lenin Museum. There was not a soul in the museum. And this is the middle of a big, you know, Russian city. <laughs> so we're the only visitor. And so she said, well, I can't show you around. I, you know, I, uh, I don't have any uh, Russian speaking docents. I said, well, it's okay. I speak Russian. You can uh, get a sign as a Russian speaking docent and I'll, I'll interpret. So we got this Russian speaking woman. She was a Tatar, you know, Kazan is a Tatar city. It's not a Russian city. And so her native language was, uh, you know, a Tatar, a Turkish language, not Russian. So her Russian was better than mine, but not a lot better. <laughs> but we could communicate. And she said, well, you know, uh, after we'd gotten to know each other and walked through all the bedrooms, we went to little Lenin's uh, bedroom with his own copy of Das Kapital on the bedside table. <laughs> and she said, you know, it's just unbelievable. You're the only visitors we've had this week. You know, and how is it that uh, it, the home of the founder of the Soviet Union, there aren't any Russians here. And uh, we've, I have to give this talk to uh, visiting Americans. And she says, you know, I was a, a little uh, October kid and I had a, I was a pioneer. I was Komsomol. And then I wake up one day and the, the whole thing collapses, you know, and what, what has happened? <laughs> and so this poor woman, you know, she was much like your generation. She had been brainwashed from childhood, been a very good kid, you know, very honest. She did everything they told her, you know, good-hearted. But the whole thing was a lie, and she it just didn't, she couldn't understand how they could have lied to her, you know, throughout her whole, her whole experience. And uh, so that's sort of what's happening with the climate message today. It's much like the uh, Soviet Union message, you know, and uh, so we've got a whole generation like this poor docent, you know, at the Linen Museum in Kazan. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that a number of times, people drawing conclusions to relate us to the Soviet Union and its collapse. And as someone who doesn't know about the Soviet Union that well, I definitely need to get more informed and read some books on that. It does seem relatable that the Soviet Union had reached a point where so much of its society had been predicated on lies yeah. that it just collapsed. And then you look at where we are, especially nowadays, not just with climate, but with a number of issues, feels like a lot of them are built on lies that you cannot question. And what's the next logical step? It feels like collapse. Right. No, that's true. And, uh, you know, a society to be uh, stable, most people have to feel like, uh, it, well, maybe it's not perfect, but it's reasonably fair, you know. And, um, you know, there are mistakes made, but uh, in general, it's fair. And I think the problem with America today is fewer and fewer people believe that. You know, there was a time when, um, you know, it was certainly... Our society was not fair to uh, blacks. You know, I, I was born uh, before the end of segregation, so I remember what segregation was like in the South, and it was profoundly unfair and evil. And uh, so, but most people, you know, were not black Southerners, and so they didn't sense it, you know. So the majority of people thought society was reasonably fair. <laughs> But now I, I think that uh, many, many more of us now, black and white, recognize that uh, there's something wrong with a system that, uh, you know, if you've got enough money, for example, you can use the court system to destroy your enemies. And, uh, you know, look what, Mark, look what happened to uh, uh, Mark Stein, you know, from uh, uh, Michael Mann in Washington, you know. Uh, you know, completely, uh, completely out of control. You know, if you, and uh, most of them, the wealth is being used. People perceive against them. You know, against the average person, they feel. Uh, now, you know, of course, a lot of that is, uh, some of it is exaggeration, but I don't think it's all exaggeration. And so, on, until that gets corrected. Uh, 
you know, we're not on a very good case for uh, a very good course for American society. Uh, and so uh, on, on every issue where that is happening, we need to push back. You know, there has to be a sense of fairness. Of, and uh, uh, that's certainly, uh, for the time being, it's out the window. Yeah. I mean, you said it. We are at a point in time where young people are legitimately making the decision not to have children. Yeah. Believing that they're doing their part to fight climate change. Right. That's right. Yeah. How absurd is that? Well, it's, uh, I I mean, I just feel bad for the young people because they're making a sacrifice for, uh, uh, you know, for a lie, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you have children, but, uh, you know, I had a couple of kids and uh, they were a joy, you know, I, <laughs> not all the time. But uh, nevertheless, that's a, uh, one of the great things of life is to be able to raise children and grandchildren and uh, uh, not and to have that taken away from you for no reason. You know, in fact, for a lie is that it's a terrible thing. And uh, so. um We've let, done a lot of done a lot of damage, <laughs> and to masquerade it as some noble pursuit that in making this really rather significant sacrifice, you're implementing some form of a net benefit to society. Yeah, and the reality couldn't be further from that. Yeah, that's right. No, that's that's right. You know, young people. I think all people really uh, do need a cause, you know, to make their life worthwhile. You know, there, you should be doing something in life that's worthwhile. That you get up in the morning, maybe not every morning, but you feel that, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing something worthwhile. And uh, we've made that a lot harder for young people than it used to be. Partly, I think it's. Uh, uh, wealth, you know, there's so much, uh, people are so much better off than they were, you know, a hundred years ago or even 50 years ago. And, uh, for example, now just about everyone can go to, uh, college if they would like, uh, we've made it easy for that to happen. Although, you know, some of this, uh, loan giving has been a very bad idea, you know, we've loaded people up with, uh, unnecessary debt. But, you know, when I, when I was a kid, college age, most people didn't go to college. You know, you, it was expensive and you could get a job without going to college and do very well. And, uh, but anyway, it g- gave me something to work for. Cause I could work in summers and, you know, after school, you know, to earn a little money to go to college. So I, I felt I was doing something that was, uh, worthwhile. And, uh, We've made that much, much harder. It's harder to get a job, for example. And I think, for example, California passing these minimum wage laws, it's really uh, making things worse for young people because uh, there's no reason you should pay some high school kid $20 an hour when they don't know anything. You know, you should pay them something so that they have the pleasure of earning something and feeling good about doing something. And that, that's much more important at that age than the uh, amount of the pay. And uh, so, uh, so somebody who understands human nature uh, has been asleep at the switch uh, uh, in much of society, certainly in California. <laughs> Maybe this is a naive stance, but I would assume that that sense of fulfillment has been fulfilled throughout most of history by having children. And now we're in a point in time where through social pressures or changes in economic status, people just having kids later and later in life, the thing that has fulfilled that place are these social causes, which has reinforced a sort of religious dogma that is so intense and so strong because it's not just this movement that you're a part of. It's something for the greater good. You're fighting for this social change. Yeah. And if you don't have kids at home that you have to worry about or you're not, 
you know, working some super strenuous job and you're just trying to get through the day. Yeah. No. All of your attention is going on this. This has taken such a part of your life mm-hmm. that it just carries so much more weight than it would otherwise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we tried to remedy that a little bit with things like the Peace Corps. I think that was fundamentally a good idea. And, um, you know, I, many people who participated in the Peace Corps were actually uh, quite helpful. You know, you had farm kids who, you know, who knew how to feed animals, uh, go off to uh, introduce modern farming to places where it really helped or to teach English so you could uh, advance yourself. And uh, But somehow that has... Uh, faded into the background. Uh, maybe the Peace Corps still exists. I'm not sure. But uh, but some, some sort of uh, cause that where you can, uh, uh, you, you can make a difference and feel good about yourself. Uh, we ought to make that available. I, you, know, so, you know, I look at sometimes at the Mormons, you know, if you're a Mormon, you have to go out and do a, be a missionary for a year or two. And I think, uh, you know, that's actually a good thing. You know, they don't get very much pay for that, and they, they feel like they're contributing to a cause. And uh, so something like that, you know, but on a grander scale, more universal scale, uh, maybe universal isn't right, maybe it should be individual parts of society. But but uh, to have this sort of idleness and, and lack of mission, you know, I think it, it's just a toxic uh situation for young people they they have to feel like they have a cause and uh and it's just terrible the way that that has been uh, turned into this climate cause which isn't a cause at all it's just nonsense (laughs) yeah and in terms of climate how can you have another cause if you feel like the world is going to end in the next few decades that's right yeah (laughs) what are you going to do you have to be a climate fanatic because otherwise even if you did have kids they're not going to have a world to inherit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're attacked on multiple fronts on that one. Yeah. One of the things that I never understood in relation to climate, if it was such a disaster that we were heading towards, why has there not been a significant push towards nuclear energy? Why are we putting up with these lesser technologies like wind farms like solar farms that still you know are have byproducts i mean they bury wind turbines in the ground these turbine blades i don't know if anyone's having that conversation yeah but it seems like we have this energy source that is cleaner than most of the other ones that we have if not the cleanest currently available to us and nobody there's no push there's no significant movement for nuclear energy well, I think there are, there are really two objections. Uh, the one that is, uh, I have some sympathy for is the uh, issue of nuclear weapon proliferation. You know, if you have commercial nuclear power all over the world, it gets harder and harder to inventory the plutonium out there, which you can use to make a bomb. And uh, But I think you could manage that. You know, I, we've done a pretty good job with commercial nuclear power to keep that under control. But that's that's a real issue. The other is that supposedly, uh, you know, it, it's uh, exist, existential threat. There are all these existential threats in the world, the climate, you know, you know, eugenics uh, and nuclear. And, uh, well, you know, if you design a nuclear plant uh, properly, uh, uh, it really is quite safe, as you say. It, it's probably better than almost any other uh, source of electrical power that we use today. You know, they're, they're all good, but nuclear has had so much pressure that it's especially good. And um, so uh, part of it is that, you know, there's this uh, unnatural fear of radiation, you know, that. Uh, it's radioactive, and, and sh- sure enough, nuclear is it's very radioactive. doesn't work without that. Uh, but uh, the amount of radiation is, is completely trivial, and uh, in most cases, it's far less than you get naturally from wherever you live. 
you know, the natural background radiation. And, and it's exaggerated by this, uh, this uh, linear, no threshold response to radiation, you know, that, you know, if you get uh, uh, one unit of radiation, some unit is enough to kill you, but a thousandth of that, you don't notice it at all. Uh, then, uh, nevertheless, if a thousand people get a thousandth of this uh, toxic dose, that one of them will die. You know, that's sort of the linear, no threshold argument, which is clearly wrong. You know, experimentally, it doesn't work. There's all sorts of uh, 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 science that shows it's wrong, but it's accepted. You know, it's a li- like climate change, it's accepted. And so you can use that argument to say that nuclear plants are uh, killing lots of people. You know, bananas kill, kill lots of people, too, because they're quite radioactive. <laughs> you know, as part of my thesis, I did low-level counting, and, you know, I, I was good. At, 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 and one of, the re- one of the things I was careful was I kept people away from my counters because we're radioactive, you and I, because of the potassium in our blood. <laughs> And I, I, you know, the last thing I would do is get, you know, a person near to my counters because they were so radioactive. (laughs) And the radio, you know, radiation really doesn't harm us, you know, in in the amounts that uh, you get from your own blood or from uh, reactors if if you control it properly. But most people don't understand that. And they, they think even the tiniest amount of radiation, it's going to, they're going to have children with five heads, you know, all of these, these crazy stories, you know, that are not true. But people believe them. And uh, so I, I don't know why that is being pushed so hard. It, it just, uh, uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, there is this call. I, I talked about the need for a cause. And so there are a certain fraction of people who've always seized on this as a cause, the cause will be we'll push back against the modern world, against uh, technology and all the things that have made the world such a good place to be in our generation compared to a thousand years ago. And uh, we'll claim that it's evil and that it's, it's, of course, none of that makes any sense. Life expectancy goes up and up and up and, and people keep talking about how the modern world is, is uh, killing us. It's, Completely, completely the opposite. You know, we're living longer and more healthy lives thanks to modern technology and and sensible, uh, uh, sensible people. Uh, but the, I don't know. Sensible people have always been in short supply. <laughs> yeah, and even the ones that are out there can be influenced to some degree. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Seems to if me, we, to ex- what do you say, Nick? Have we <laughs> been at this long enough? <laughs> yeah, we can wrap this. I had one question I wanted to ask you here to wrap up. Yeah. Where does science go from here? You know, we're at a time where a lot of our formerly trusted institutions have kind of eroded credibility. And if the other hat were to drop in terms of climate, what do you think, how does that reverberate through science as a field? Well, I think science will continue, and uh, there are parts of science that I think are still pretty healthy, and uh, so they'll pick up any slack from the collapse of the climate narrative. And there are good climate scientists, as we've discussed, who've just been afraid, you know, to buck the trend. And uh, if, if they're given a little bit of relief and realize they can put their head up, they will continue doing good science. And uh, so I, I'm not too <laughs> worried about that. I, I think science will go on. But it, as we saw in Lysenko and the Soviet Union, it, it will have caused a lot of damage to, uh, to the science of climate. And, um, but that'll get repaired. You know, we don't solve it in our generation. At least that gives something to challenge the next generation. <laughs> And so maybe we've done them a favor, at least in this little part. That's hoping the next generation is going to be around. I mean, we'll be around. The the rub that is climate in some sense is that we are all expelling CO2. I think it's two pounds per day. That's right. And as, as we get closer to this net zero goal, 
where do people play into that? Do we have to start reducing population, which gets into a whole other realm, in order to keep that sustainable? Well, I think you know that the the real fanatics think the world is greatly overpopulated and shouldn't be more than a billion people, preferably less. And so I always scratch my head and look around and the room, and that means that seven out of eight people in the room have to disappear. You know, well, how do we decide that? And how do we do that? You know, it's crazy. It's Looney Tunes. And uh, the Earth's population is, is pretty clearly going to maximize, I think, within uh, a few more decades, because the thing that really limits population and may actually be a serious uh, problem uh, eventually is when you make people prosperous, women just don't want to have huge flocks of kids. You know, it's it's a hard life. And yeah, there are good things about kids, but, you know, they do cut into your uh, freedom, especially if you're a woman. And uh, so it all over the world, wherever people have become prosperous women uh, stop having as many children and usually have fewer than are ne- necessary to sustain the population that's certainly true in japan it's true in europe true in china now you know it's true in the united states if we didn't have immigration you know u.s population would be going down so uh, I, i'm not a i'm not worried about overpopulation i think at some point uh, the <laughs> The problem will be underpopulation. How, how do you persuade women to have enough children to uh, uh, to reach steady state, <laughs> whatever that happens to be? Yeah. Okay. Well, Will, I I really appreciate you taking this time to come on and chat with me. This was a lot of fun. Okay, Nick. Well, it's fun to talk to you. Thanks for what you're doing, and keep it up. <laughs> do you have anything you want to put out there? Any resources for people interested? Well, if you if you're interested in some facts about CO two, look at the website of the CO two coalition. You can Google it; you'll find it. And uh, there's a lot of pretty good science there. And uh, uh, I may, you know, I, I try to look over it, try to make sure there's not too much nonsense. And I think it's pretty sound. <laughs> mm-hmm.